Um, all right, then we'll get started. So, um, hello and welcome to Riding the Scare Waves, a celebration of tales from beyond the pale. Uh, my name is Craig. I'm the co-organizer of the Fear 2000 conference series, and I'm really, really excited to be joined by Larry Fessenden, Glenn McQuaid, April Snellings, and Clay McLeod Chapman. Uh, so first of all, I'm just going to do some quick introductions. Uh, Larry Fessenden is an actor, writer, director, and producer, and the founder of the independent production house Glass Eye Picks. His films as director include No Telling, Habit, Wendigo, The Last Winter, and Depraved. There's a good chance that he's in your favorite indie horror movie, and he probably dies in it horribly. Uh, Glenn McQuaid is the director of the festival favorite I Sell the Dead, and the man behind the Tuesday the 17th segment in the found footage horror anthology VHS. Uh, together, Fessenden and McQuaid are the pale men, the founders and principal writers of Tales from Beyond the Pale, a series of macabre, I can't say that quite as well as, as Larry can, uh, radio plays for the digital age, which is now available as a podcast. Uh, we're also joined by two writers who have contributed ep episodes to uh, the series. So April Snellings is a writer, editor, and journalist who has contributed to such magazines as Rue Morgue and The Big Thrill. She's author, also the author of the excellent uh, Ghoulish, The Art of Gary Pullen, which is awesome and you should buy it. Um, April wrote the episodes uh, Food Chain and with Glenn McQuaid, Cold Reading and Speaking in Tongues. And finally, uh, we have Clay McLeod Chapman. Uh, he's the author of novels including Whisper Down the Lane and The Remaking. And with Craig McNeil, uh, the screenwriter of festival hit The Boy. Clay also writes comics and has uh, penned issues of The Amazing Spider-Man and Absolute Carnage for Marvel. He is the writer of the tales episodes like Father Like Son, The Mattress King and with Fessenden and McQuaid, the two-part episode uh, Tales We Tell. Uh, and just before we get started, I just really want to say thank you so much to all of you for giving up your time for this. We're quite a small event and we really appreciate you agreeing to do it. Thank you for having us. Um, so we'll get into it. Um, Larry and Glenn, I know you've probably told this story a, a million times before, but I think it's helpful to kind of start at the beginning and give our audience some context for Tales from Beyond the Pale and where it comes from. Uh, so could you give us a little bit of context for how the project came about? what it was that made you want to start producing audio horror, uh, and especially in the 21st century when it's not exactly the, the kind of main medium that people go to for their horror stories these days. Uh, sure, I'll start and Larry, you can chip in. Um, well, really, I, I think we romanticize it somewhat in that it's now become a fog-drenched, tundrous car journey up to the Catskills uh, to the set of Jim Mickle's Stakeland. But truthfully, it was a, a car journey with myself, Larry Fessenden, and his son, Jack Fessenden. And uh, Larry was, Larry threw on a couple of audio dramas. Um, I believe they, oh God, I can't remember the name of the piece we were listening to, but it had Vincent Price as a surgeon. Um, who brought his wife back from the dead, basically. And, and for most of the radio plays, dead wife is running around an old mansion with a scalpel, just sort of stabbing people, <laughs> not even <laughs> killing them, just sort of like being a nuisance. And uh, I was like, oh my God, Larry, this is fucking great. We have to do this. You know, Glass Eye Picks really should get in on this because I think at the time um, I was coming off of I Sell the Dead and most of my ideas have always been kind of uh, very ambitious in terms of low budget filmmaking, you know, even I Sell the Dead, um, you know, as a period movie set in like some kind of the fictitious British Isles somewhere, you know, which we shot in mostly in Staten Island, <laughs> in the New York and, and the scripts I'd written Right after that, um, we're really, really grandiose as well. Um, wrote a piece called The Damned and the Dangerous with Ted Gagan, which is a giant vampire movie, a very, very splashy event and so on. So I, I was always having trouble because people would read these scripts and they were like, okay, well, how are we gonna make this, you know, without having $30 million at our disposal? So um, I feel like, uh, audio drama was tempting in that sense because, you know, here we were listening to this incredible uh, radio play that was set in this mansion and we all could picture it individually. It was so lush and just epic. 
and yet yeah, was probably made for relatively next to nothing. So the temptation was there to, you know, um, explore that format. Uh, I would just add, Glenn, I think it was Boris Karloff, not uh, Vincent Price. Um, but we'll, we'll track it down sometime and, and get to the bottom of it. Uh, I can only say that my kid was at an age where I was telling him stories. And so I was very keyed back into uh, audio dramas, which is why I threw that on that day. And um, when Glenn suggested it, I really seized on the idea of, um, you know, not only my love of audio dramas, which is longstanding, uh, I listened to them as a kid. I also would tape old movies off of the TV. This was before VHS, and I would listen to movies like Casablanca. And, uh, and so it just gave me this appreciation for sound, which we carried on through all of the Thai West films. We had great sound design in all of our, uh, all of our movies. Um, and, and so it was just a world that I was excited to get into. And the other thing is that having produced some of these low budget films and all the collaborations that I had, I felt excited at the potential of inviting a bunch of uh, filmmakers and other people aboard to, to help us in our mission. And that became, um, I think Glenn always likes to tell the story that he thought these radio plays would all be written by him. <laughs> but I was uh, excited at the uh, prospect of being sort of host to other authors. And so we ended up embracing that for our first season. And we've gone back and forth ever since. And then of course, Clay, um, I'll just wrap up by saying that Clay comes into the picture because he was hosting a live uh, stage um, sort of horror, um, you know, get together with interviews of different horror people. And he had this wonderful uh, weekly show down in the East Village of Manhattan. And then he was going to have a baby and he realized he couldn't do uh, the October uh, series as he always had. And he said, do you guys want to take over? So our second season, Glenn and I uh, took a uh, live to the stage and that was where the whole project opened up into uh, this sort of traveling road show, which we've done ever since going to festivals. So that's sort of the background. Okay, so that, that kind of leads on to a, a couple of questions I've got here, but I'll, I'll start with this one. So I was going to ask uh, April and Clay, uh, you wrote your first episodes for Tales a, a year or so apart, I think. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about what attracted you to Tales from Beyond the Pale and wanting to write for it. Uh, and was there anything you found particularly rewarding or challenging about telling stories through sound alone? Clay, you want to go first? Sure, sure. I, you know, it's it's funny because uh, the series that Larry's mentioning was called Fear Mongers, and it was like a Tonight Show for the the genre crowd, and it it dovetailed quite naturally into a, a, a more kind of prairie home companion version of Tales from Beyond the Pale to kind of bring it on its feet to have both the the live performative version of Tales but also to record those episodes and and get the kind of you know there there would be the the listening experience for those at home who couldn't have been there that night but it also had that that weird alchemy of being both live and uh you know the fixing it in post i guess um where you know it, it almost evolved into something new and kind of carried that energy of a live performance over um my i, I think my kind of background upbringing was in live performance so having the ability to uh you know write a tale that that was in essence a you know a radio play but but for a live audience it it kind of leaned into its live performance aspect and i think that energy is something that really you know hearing the recordings recently like it's you can kind of feel that 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 kind of i don't know lightning in a jar um which i don't think you would you know in the studio recordings it's a very kind of contained experience it, it feels like you're you're really leaning into the the, the the kind of sound effect of it where I don't know like the 
you know, maybe it's just me and my kind of personal experience, but like I can hear Glenn kind of lunging for the sound effect and like slamming his shoulder into, you know, like, you know, like those melons are really on stage and like you can, the, the kind of palpable experience of that, um, you know, it, it's it's Garrison Keeler with a, a butcher knife. And I, I think there's something very, special about that. And I hope that translates to the, the actual listening experience as well. Well, as someone who's never seen it live, it does. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Actually, like, like Father Like Son is one of my favorite tales ever. Like, I don't know if I've ever told you that, but um, it just, it, 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 it no. hits on so many notes. I think it's fantastic. It's, uh, it's, it's really funny and it's really sad and disturbing. And I think that those tonal switches work so well um, in an audio format that it's just, it's terrific and it's gross, which is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, the last thing I'll say and is that it really helps to have someone like Larry Fessenden star in your pieces. Like I, I feel fortunate that Larry was the lead in, in both of my contributions. So um, I, it's, you know, it, I, I got the heavy, I got the big guns. So I, I actually met um, Larry and Glenn through through my my day job as a journalist. I had interviewed them for um, definitely Famous Monsters of Filmland, but I think probably also Remorgue. Maybe I, I don't. It's it's been a it's been a minute. But um, Glenn and I really connected about of all things um, uh, old horror comics, old you know fifties DC horror comics, which. Uh, that's I think a, a major kind of vibe that that sort of runs through through tales. And uh, when they asked me if I had any thoughts on on a tale that I might like to do, um, the the audio thing actually was a huge um, opportunity because uh, yeah, I, I did a, a Bigfoot story, and I feel like Bigfoot is a thing that that often doesn't come off very well visually. I mean, it's really difficult to to make a Bigfoot that looks quite as good as anything you can imagine. Um, and I wasn't aware of uh, that there was a big, you know, vein of, of, of Bigfoot audio dramas out there already. So I think we kind of had a chance to, to, you know, go for, you know, just, just what does Bigfoot sound like and, and what's it like to be in the woods and, and just have that kind of that, um, you know, just that, that audio experience. And, and I think that was a huge uh, boon to the story. Like, I don't think that Food Chain would, would and I'm saying this, but um, we're actually, I'm working with someone else to, to possibly develop Food Chain as a film. And that's been a big um, thing is like, how do we take this thing that works so well in an audio format and make it work visually? But uh, so I probably shouldn't say this, but I, I feel like it works better, you know, just as, as something that you experience as a radio play. Well, uh, let's remind the audience who plays Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> and who was that again? Who was our Bigfoot? <laughs> that was the sound of me, the modern yeah. Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> and he was fantastic, and I still have many, many, many photos that I'm that I'm saving for for blackmail someday of, of Glenn really? in, the, uh, in the booth, <laughs> killing it as. Uh, and actually, it's, Glenn's monster dog contributed some uh, some pretty gnarly sound effects too. Alfred, well, my he's dog, been in quite a few tales, right? <laughs> yeah, he's in. Anytime we need like somebody being torn apart or their bones being crunched, we tend to use. I, I've recorded Alfred. He's kind of on a weird diet, like he'll eat raw meat, <laughs> he'll eat raw bones, you know. So he, I, I've, I've, I've just put a mic up to him having his dinner a couple of times, and I think most effectively was in uh, Stuart Gordon's uh, H.P. Lovecraft's The Hound, that uh, just one of the characters has just been eaten alive for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> you know, after a while, it really is just Alfred having his dinner. So. <laughs> Well, uh, Food Chain genuinely is one of my favorite episodes of Tales. Um, oh, thank you. I've got some questions that I'd like to ask all four of you about individual episodes you've written. Um, so hopefully we can come back to Food Chain. I've got a, 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 a specific question I'd like to ask you about that. Um, but kind of uh, going back a tiny little bit and thinking about that EC Comics connection and uh, those, th those kind of classic horror radio episodes, um, are there any particular elements of the series or even entire episodes you think that really draw on, engage with, or owe something to that horror radio, that classic horror radio tradition? Um, so I think we could, we could start with Jeff Grace's theme or we could talk about Larry's horror host, um, but I'd be interested in knowing, uh, you know, how all four of you feel about that. 
Sure, I'll, I'll start. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, EC Comics just, I was never into like superheroes as a kid. I never get into superhero comics as a kid, but I always had um, uh, EC horror as well as creepy and eerie, as well as there is a British horror comic called Scream um, from I think probably the same folks that maybe brought out 2000 AD. I don't know if there was, there was some kind of connection there. So uh, uh, horror comics, and horror comics and movies like Creepshow, for instance, were always a really big uh, influence on me. Um, and actually, I remember the name of the audio drama that we listened to. It's a thing called Death Robbery. And Larry, you're right. It is with Boris Karloff. It's from Lights Out. Um, and uh, I just love the fun uh, and escapism of it as well. And I think initially for me with Tales, it was good enough for me to just tap into that and homage that with Trawler, uh, mm. my first audio drama for Tales, as well as the second one, The Crush, um, which we did um, at Dixon Place Live. Uh, and, and these are truly just pure homages to that kind of world tapping into it. I mean, there are original stories and stuff, but there was imagining there, they really are like tales that I could see in the pages of those kind of comics. Yeah, the, the, the episodes that jump to my mind when I think of episodes that really owe something to horror comics and horror radio are um, The Crush and The Hole Digger, I think. Right. Maybe passing on to Larry. Yeah, well, I appreciate that because The Hole Digger actually happened to me. So it was one of those stories that is passed down at the dinner table over and over and the parents have a foggy memory and, and I have an even stranger memory. But that, that whole thing unfolded. Um, one thing that's interesting about Tales format wise, well, to quickly get it out of the way, of course, I was uh, excited to, I think we decided fairly early on to do a host and we sort of found that character and he shifts slightly over time. And when it's live, I get a little broader. Uh, it's more intimate in the, uh, the studio versions. But my influence was uh, Albert Hitchcock Presents and he also did a couple of, or at least one seminal uh, audio, you know, an old record that I would listen to over and over, a series of short stories, and then he would come on with the usual Hitchcock uh, attitude, and I just was always fond of that, and then obviously uh, Rod Sterling with the Twilight Zone, so even more than the Crypt Keeper, which I always thought was a little too campy for my taste, it was these uh, more philosophical presentations that, um, you know, Rod Sterling obviously was offering some pop philosophy in, in his openings. So there was that for me. As for the, the oh, well, what I was going to say is what's interesting about tales is, is the, the minutia of do you have a narrator that presents the story? And I think Glenn and I have done the absolute gamut. The Crush, which is a very EC story, has the fantastic narrator, uh, this wistful performance by uh, Sean Young. And, and you know it's a recollection and then the same with uh, the hole digger and then all the way to the other extreme which glenn did most recently where there's no dialogue at all so we've always played with the structural conceits do you have a narrator carrying you along are you just fly on the wall listening to and you know i think we both enjoy making it more and more cinematic and like there's certain techniques we both have used to create edits, you know, where you really feel like, oh, wow, close up of a tire, and now we're in the car, you know, and this sort of thing. So lots of great, uh, fun devices. And, and obviously, some of our collaborators who wrote their own shows um, would come up with things. Uh, Graham Resnick created an entire false audio uh, cassette that people would listen to to calm themselves, and then that becomes uh, a vessel for his story. Uh, so lots of fun structural things to think about. Yeah, that was that was something. My my next question actually that that although a lot of tales feel quite traditional and feel like they fit into that kind of forties fifties horror radio kind of um, I want to say aesthetic, but it's not an aesthetic because it's sound. <laughs> but um, th there are those episodes like the Chambers tape, um, like Int Coffin Night, um, and I, I think what I wanted to ask you really is I think you've kind of just touched on this a bit, is, is it important to you to keep pushing the limits of the medium, to keep trying to do different things? You know, I also think of 
um, Simon Barrett's episode Dead Air, which is presented as a live radio show, uh, is another of my favorites. So is it important to you to keep trying to push the boundaries of what's possible? Well, I'll just say that uh, one thing we felt very strongly right from the get go was that, you know, yes, okay, this is an old medium. Uh, it's an old format, the radio play. But we never wanted to uh, sort of lean into that old timey radio. And even though the host is a little bit like, you know, welcome, the, the idea was to have boldly, even to the point of shocking storytelling, and most particularly to use sound effects to engage the audience way beyond the usual clip clop, clip clop uh, foley that you hear, you know, and we have great musical accompaniment in a lot of the tales. Glenn has more recently started writing his own music and even composed for uh, Stuart Gordon's piece. And well, that's not true, forgive me, but um, didn't you write for somebody, Glenn? Uh, yeah, <laughs> actually, um, uh, 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 Richard Band did the music for, uh, uh, for the Hound. But yeah, I've been doing a lot of audio, uh, true tales ended up doing a lot of music and, and sound design. But um, I agree. I think that when we initially started, there was a great enthusiasm. I remember, Larry, one of the first things we got together, we were talking about it. And I don't know if you played it for me or I played it, but we were just listening to a horse galloping, you know, and we we're like, oh my God, you know, so enthusiastic about, you know, these simple tropes that, of course, you know, we had great fun diving into them. Um, and on my own journey with Tales, I feel like it's, it's, it, was, it was enough again to start off with the trawler and, and, and crush and to just tell these stories in that world and in that format. Uh, but then gradually as I've gone on, I've wanted to um, really uh, push my push my own bounds as a writer, try things I wouldn't normally do, but also try things that I'm not really hearing within the format itself, like the last one, Interior Coffin Night. Um, actually, it was sort of a challenge to myself to write an audio drama with no dialogue because somebody told me I absolutely couldn't do it. <laughs> so I was, I was adamant that that would be the next piece I did. But I think we've always kind of straddled the line a bit of, of, of um, you know, being really enamored by the, uh, the history of the format and, and, the, and the gems that are, are, are within the history of it, but also just trying new tr things, pushing things um, and pushing ourselves in ways that it's not as, it wouldn't be as easy for me to uh, have traveled this path simply by being a filmmaker because it, it just the, the experimentation that we're capable of in the audio drama world is is fantastic it's tremendously liberating as a writer to know that whatever you write is actually getting produced you know so just push 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 you know try and to also i mean i love monsters um and uh I've made more monster stories on tales because you don't actually have to, you know, but make poop or for that matter, the CGI. But, uh, you know, I have creatures that attack a gondola, uh, flying winged creatures. I mean, how would you ever uh, mount that production? And then, uh, but speaking of uh, pushing the envelope, uh, early on the second season, I made uh, a tale called Caper. And the idea was that some guys break into a house, but the house is haunted or in other words uh supernatural and there's a wonderful book called house of leaves uh where the inside of the house is bigger than the outside and that was always just such an incredible idea and i took the idea of that and staircases that get bigger maybe that's a harry potter type thing but all of the stuff done in film is extremely elaborate and not only was it cheaper to do it audio wise, but also a challenge to the audience. How do you make the staircase become forever large? Well, you drop a telephone and you hear it go, ching, chong, ching, chong, ching, chong, ching, you know, more than three flights. So uh, whether or not that succeeds entirely, this is the sort of challenge that just makes life so exciting in the Tales universe. And one last thought is that 
if you really were to analyze over five seasons, all the locations, I mean, we have stories that take place in space, uh, in deep space, on, on, on spaceships, uh, on, on trawlers, on, you know, on the moors with, with demon uh, dogs and, uh, and all manner of other wonderful locations, all of them through sound. So it's just uh, endlessly delightful possibilities. For filmmakers to get the invitation to say your imagination is, you know, that's your limit. So tell the story you want to tell and we'll, we'll sculpt it sonically. It, you know, it's a limitless budget. And I, and I feel like that's something that a lot of these filmmakers have, you know, sunk their teeth into um, more so than like, you know, this goes beyond HBO's Tales from the Crypt. This goes beyond the like, you know, and it with with a fraction of the budget, but it's 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 purely the the the, the sound that kind of carries you to these to outer space, to the trawler, to the gondola, um, and you don't need all the extra bells and whistles. Like that's, I think that's the kind of the the strength by by kind of closing your eyes or asking the audience to kind of like, you know, relegate their sensory experience. It it kind of expands the narrative scope in its own way, which I. I find kind of infinitely more interesting and more rewarding as a, a creator, storyteller. I think that, that there is there is one way in which Tales is is very, very traditional, uh, which is that most of the episodes have been released on physical media of some kind. So you've got vinyl, you've got CDs, and you've even done a cassette tape. <laughs> Um, and I wondered, is it is it important to you that, that, that there is that analog experience involved in listening to Tales from Beyond the Pale? There aren't very many, you know, horror podcasts that are still putting out physical releases. So is that something that's important to you? Well, I'll go then, Glenn, if you're not going to. <laughs> uh, very much from the start, what was important to us is to have a, a graphic identity. And we went to, speaking of April and her wonderful book, uh, we went to Gary Pullins first. I think that was Glenn's inspiration. And uh, Gary kindly said, sure, I'll do your first 10 posters. And more importantly, I'll, uh, I'll define the, um, the entire series with uh, the, the Tales graphic. And we worked with Gary for quite a while um, on all of those elements, including even uh, the website, which we now call the archived website, but you see how it all came together with his wonderful, you know, Rue Morgue sensibility. And it was important to us, we would fetishize making the posters because that is where we felt a connection to the comic books, the EC books of yore and, uh, and all of that. And then physical media, Glenn is an aficionado of vinyl. And so it was really thrilling to, uh, we were invited uh, by a guy to put out a, a gatefold double album of two of our favorite tales, uh, Hold Digger and Trawler. And, uh, you know, it meant so much to me to drop the needle because as I said, this was my youth listening to that one Hitchcock album and just, you know, and it was fun because we had to figure out the host actually says, you know, you'll have to flip the record. So we just, those little things, this kind of the aesthetic of, of I think our whole youth just came flooding back. Mm -hmm. Also, I don't know, Craig, but have you heard the read along? Another wonderful creation. Ah, yeah. there you go. That's from Holy Mountain Printing and it's a little seven inch, two poems that Glenn and I did sort of as if they were for children, although they're very dark tales. Uh, and, and you have a little read along, you can uh, look at the picture. So yeah, all of the physical media is essential to our world. The experience is really different. Like uh, just as a listener, um, I get a different experience listening to Hole Digger or Trawler on vinyl as opposed to if I listen to it on my computer. Um, it, it's just different. You know, it sounds different. There's a different relationship to the media. Um, you know, there's, can you pause it? Can you not pause it? Do you need to just sit and, and, and commit to the entire story or to, to half of the story before you flip or, you know, whatever. And it, that, that affects the, uh, the experience a lot. And I think it's super cool to be able to have different, you know, different ways to experience the stories. And you look at the cover, you know, that's the old thing. You'd get a David Bowie album and you'd look yeah. at the same damn cover for the entire side of the record. Well, mm -hmm. that's what you do. And we have a very nice, the gatefold is very sweet. You could peruse all the details and little 
Easter eggs and all that. Once again, all the, the pleasures of, uh, I don't know, childhood and physical media and, and fetishizing. And, and also the grandfather is also available as a vinyl and that's um, a beautiful cover, very thoughtful uh, tribute to Angus who had passed when that came out. I think also with the artwork, I mean, we really, uh, you in particular, Larry, really fetishized that gatefold for Trawler and uh, and uh, the whole digger. I mean, we went back and forward with that a lot and just wanted to be something that somebody could really, and it is, you know, you can kind of get lost in that. Um, when I was a kid, we had the Grease soundtrack, right? <laughs> and it's similar, you open it up, it's all kind of, Note school notebooks and scribbles. Oh, yeah. I would sit at it for ages. I think I was Olivia Newton John. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's a really cool brief, and it's an important brief for us to um, yeah, to give to the artists because you know uh, they're putting an image and they're putting a tone uh, and sort of a whole other dimension to our work uh, with a visual, you know. So mm -hmm. we've, I think we've been very lucky. We started off with uh, Gary and, and um, uh, a, a guy called Trevor Denham we do, has done a lot of work and- um, Brian Level. Brian Level, yeah. Uh, it's, it's something we've, we've taken very seriously, but it's all always been an awful lot of fun and we'll ask for a couple of thumbnails um, first and, and we'll take it from there because to, as I say, it's it's important to us, uh, you know, this being the one image for the actual piece, um, what what that showcases, what that changes about our work. Well, this is the thing about uh, Glass Eye is we really like to pretend that we're uh, in the big boy league, we're in big boy pants, but what we're really celebrating is, especially growing up in the 70s, the taxi driver poster was essential, obviously the shining poster. The point is, is that these things, the Jaws poster, you know, they defined uh, the entire experience of a movie. And, um, and that's a tradition that I think is, is possibly being lost, although we don't have to frame it that way. The bottom line is it's a, it's a central, uh, the graphic element, and certainly with music, which has been fractured because we're on Spotify, we're not really uh, having a full album experience, but all of those things uh, I think matter to both Glenn and I and, and most of our comrades growing up uh, have an association with uh, the physical media and the, the, the way it's marketed and presented. Um, it's just always been one of my pleasures. What could be more fun than reading uh, a book of movie posters, you know, mm -hmm. be it Hitchcock or 70s or, you know, Gingold put out that wonderful book of old uh, uh, newspaper ads from the 80s and it's just endlessly readable yeah I was gonna say as you can see I'm also a fan of physical media to the point that I got a friend of mine to interrupt his holiday to New York to come and get me the chambers tape from your offices <laughs> awesome um, so uh, just kind of leading on from that then um, what led to the, the decision to launch Tales as a podcast and do you think there have been any benefits or drawbacks to entering that quite crowded arena? Um, because of the physical media, because of the live performances, because of the association with Glass Eye Picks, I've always thought of Tales as something that's quite a cult object but at the same time uh, friends of mine have started listening to Tales since it became a podcast so I wonder if you think anything has been gained or lost in that transition. Well you've just defined it. It just, I think, expanded the audience somewhat. Um, we also aren't really a podcast. It's just a terminology now. All we did is we released uh, the tales for free, sadly, mm -hmm. after so many kind people had paid for them. <laughs> we said, okay, fine. Uh, and we just put them up for free. And so it's a little discouraging. Neither I nor Glenn have ever been particularly good at the business side of all of this. And I suppose we should have advertising and all sorts of things. Yes, Glenn, note to self. <laughs> Remember to have the advertising meeting as soon as this call is over. But uh, we just wanted to share them and put them all in one place. And then once again, the way we fetishize things, it was fun to change the order. You see, we released them 
in a new order actually during COVID. So we felt we were doing a service as well. Um, and, uh, you know, we had nice little discussions about each one as they came out. And it was just a way to, um, uh, to just re-engage with another imaginary audience. All our audiences <laughs> seem to be imaginary unless you're in the theater and they're actually there. That's always fun. I think it's uh, it was a way to keep the project motoring also, uh, you know, especially during the pandemic. I mean, I made interior coffin night then. Um, and we did a lot of work on uh, for the podcast, you know, for instance, just even the, the podcast introductions and all of that, you know, it gave us something <laughs> weekly to do, <laughs> to look forward to, you know, so we had a, I, I, I was a little frustrated in that. I felt like, you know, our, our body of work is so strong and it felt like it sort of was at a standstill and, and um, I wanted to uh, introduce it to a new audience, basically. Um, and I think that that's the podcast has actually helped a lot with that. Um, I don't think it's taken anything away from our brand either. I, I, I as it's just another outlet. Um, I think as we go forward with the project, we'll have kooky, strange, one-off uh, ideas for format uh, on pieces as well, and 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 take it from there. But I think the podcast has helped actually sales on on even even uh, buying uh, the digital versions from the website and stuff like that. So it's. It's it's all good. It's um, you know when Larry and I started with Tales from Beyond the Pale, I don't think there were really many other contemporary audio drama um, folks out there, um, and I wanted to um, reannounce ourselves and let everyone know who we are and what we've been doing. You know, for ten years now, over ten years now. So it was it was an important step in sort of. Uh, um, and uh, just re-announcing who we are and what we do. And anecdotally, it seems to me that a lot more people are aware of it now, which can only be a good thing. Um, yeah. So I think also, on that note, got, uh, sorry, Larry, go on. Uh, just quickly gloating for a moment. We got some very nice reviews, you know, of the, of the tales through the podcast, mm -hmm. you know, just uh, regular viewers or whoever they were. Um, yeah. And that was satisfying because, you know, you do do this stuff and you kind of wonder, aside from Clay and April, they always kindly show up, but does anyone else know about Tales? Uh, so it does feel like there's a slightly wider community. Yeah, I mean, I we, we have gotten some interesting reviews. I like the kind of the shitty reviews as well. That's but... our favorite. Yeah, Glenn and I, <laughs> Glenn and I obsessed reviews. over the terrible reviews. We love them. They're great. <laughs> amazing review for cold reading <laughs> like these guys are sick this is <laughs> i hate this <laughs> we screen cap those and we share them back and forth whenever one of us is in a shitty mood we have the the, the default you know but yeah there's this and it makes us feel better so <laughs> On that note, I think it's it's time to get into some episodes, maybe talk about themes a little bit. So April, we'll come back to, to Food Chain. Um, mm -hmm. The thing I really wanted to ask you was, was what was it particularly that, that made you want to write a tale about Bigfoot? It seems like an unusual su uh, subject. And I think thematically, I wonder, was it just the perfect monster to kind of talk about idiotic masculine hubris? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so I live in Tennessee. And the, the, the really fun thing about Food Chain is it's based on a true story. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, a few years ago in, in my uh, neck of the woods, which is, is a, a strange place, some idiots uh, poached a, a, a big, there's been a big effort to reintroduce elk to the, the Smoky Mountains. And some morons went and, and they poached an elk and, and, you know, just took the head and left the body. And of course they all got caught and they all, but um, I just thought, you know, prison time and a fine is great, but wouldn't it be awesome if something really, you know, something else happened to them? And that's kind of, uh, that was the, the impetus for, um, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen to a bunch of, of, of morons in the woods, you know, looking for uh, an animal that they're not equipped to, to hunt in any way, shape or form. Um, you know, Bigfoot's just fantastic. And it's just such a great, uh, 
it's a great monster to do in an audio format just because you know it it's so difficult to to visualize bigfoot in a satisfying way it comes off as you know maybe a little cheesy or maybe a little like you know guy in a suit you know, it's, it's not as scary when you see it as when you hear it yeah, I, I think it's by far the, the kind of most frightening and atmospheric piece of Bigfoot media I've ever come across. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And that is, is largely due to, to Glenn and Larry. Um, they really pushed to, uh, um, to expand those beats in the script, the, the, the hunt and the, the stalking scenes. And that was um, mm -hmm. very much their, their input to ramp up the tension and to stretch those, those beats out and make them longer and, and hopefully scarier. Mm -hmm. A couple of glances behind the curtain. Uh, April very kindly and I think modestly invited me to direct it. So it was her piece, but I was uh, directing. And uh, usually the way Tales works is you do your own sound effects when you're when you're the director, and then you know we take it to a place to polish it. But a tribute to Glenn and you know our dynamic back and forth, it, it shifts various ways. But he was really pushing me to. Uh, to do a better job on all the incredibly difficult kills. I mean, there are people who are up in a tree and then the monster pulls them down and they're having their arms ripped off. Really ambitious, crazy stuff for an audio play. And I would put something together and I'd be like, well, that's good enough. And Glenn would say, Larry, this just sucks. <laughs> and so we, we really had a good back and forth on that one. And uh, I feel like it is pretty strong. I mean, I suppose you could always get further but uh, there's a lot of difficult visual storytelling going on with sound and you pretty much feel these kills and you kind of know what's happening and it ain't pretty. So that's April's uh, madness and then Glenn's uh, standards. And I was just telling the line best I could. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write Gary specifically for you though, Larry. Like you were, you were, you were only ever the, the, the only option to. I had the best time. It's a really, uh, nuanced uh, script in the sense that these guys are are lying to each other and trying to outfoil each other so you have to do that once again with audio there's no nudging and winking to the audience you've got to be sort of a duplicitous just with the voice and uh, jeremy gardner's a great actor was so oh funny. he was terrific yeah. he was terrific and he actually improved a lot of the, the the funny funnier lines like especially early in the script and and he went even even kind of further off script and there's some really fantastic kind of b-roll stuff that that i wish could have found its way in that uh, it's just jeremy you know being mm -hmm. jeremy by far, by far one of my favorites i think um so uh clay i'll i'll, I'll uh i want to talk to you about the mattress king um because uh, i don't know if this happens to horror creators but as an academic who studies horror I'm sometimes asked what really scares me and my answer is always the same and it's capitalism, basically. Um, and I wonder if it was that same thought process that led you to, wrote, to write the, uh, the Mattress King. And if you could talk a little bit about that episode and what you wanted to communicate with it. Yes, I, well, you know, the, the true origins of it is that I, I live in Brooklyn, uh, which, you know, New York has its, its own bed bug, bed bug problem. And, um, in my neighborhood in particular, on a, almost on a daily basis, I would see this van with no windows just kind of putter down the street. And it would have two, if not three, if not four mattresses just kind of bundled up and bungee corded to the roof. And, you know, every, every garbage night, Tuesday nights, you know, Wednesday morning is the pickup. You know, you would just see these mattresses just being dumped in, in kind of clear plastic tarps. And you would know, you would know that that's those are the bed bug mattresses. And you know, teaching your kids don't don't sit on don't touch those mattresses. That's those are where the bed bugs are. And uh, it is astounding because this van with no windows, this white rusted van with no windows, would just putter by, stop at every kind of like apartment complexes garbage dump, and like pluck the mattresses and just bungee cord them onto the roof. And it for me. I was like, this is amazing. This is someone's business. This is, you know, someone is going, you know, block for block, taking the mattresses, maybe sanitizing them, maybe, you know, cleaning them up to whatever extent and then just selling them for a song. And, uh, you know, 
I, I will admit that, you know, when I first came to New York, when I first graduated from college in my first apartment, I had a roommate who unwisely bought a brand new mattress for only $75. And it was amazing. And like, all he had to do was just bring it into the house. And we got bed bugs. And it was by far the 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 most atrocious like it 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 is the bane like i i don't talk to this friend anymore like that was the end of our relationship because they brought he brought bed bugs into our lives but to go back to that van to that whoever that i mean i never saw the person behind the the wheel like i never i to this day i have no idea who that person is but it it became this idea of like I don't know, like I, I love the idea of kind of false staff. I love the idea of someone kind of regaling a bar crowd with like tales of their own kind of, you know, hubris. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it I, I don't, I, you know, whatever the kind of co combination or the kind of alchemy therein, like it was like taking that van and that process and personal experience with with bed bugs and knowing like who like asking the question like who would be the person who would do that you know knowing quite well that this is th this is what they're kind of continuing or they're furthering this 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 kind of infection on the city and it i i i wanted it to be someone who had a certain joy or a certain glee or a certain kind of poetry um and uh knowing that Larry would kind of be the person to kind of embark upon this, this, this role, it just kind of fusing his, his voice to that character. It, it, it really kind of created some, I don't know, like it was just kind of the perfect storm of all of these, these nightmares, um, Larry included. It's a really um, poetic metaphor because you've got someone who is trying to exploit poor and vulnerable people who ends up having to live their experiences quite literally. Yeah. No, you know, Larry mentioned House of Leaves. And I think that like, you know, we're in a time right now as writers, as authors, like what is what is the new terrain of ghost stories? Like what, what you know, we've had haunted houses, we've had haunted dolls. Like, can we have haunted bed mattresses? Can we have haunted bed bugs? Like what's the, what's the line and, and how can you kind of push it just a little bit more? And for me, the idea, you know, I, you know, I, I don't know how, I, it's been a while since I've listened to it, but like how in depth we get into the, the notion of like what it is to be haunted by the memories of the, you know, be haunted by the blood of those uh, yeah. on these mattresses. Like it's, it's, it's just taking the idea of like what haunts you mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's nothing more vulnerable than like laying your head down on the pillow, like mm. thinking of that vulnerable state of being asleep. And like, what if that's where your your nightmare, or that's where your ghosts kind of manifest themselves? So I think uh, predictably, uh, I'd like to talk to Larry about his werewolf story, uh, Blackout, um, just because I think it's a fascinating use of the werewolf as a metaphor. So I, I guess my question is, are you essentially kind of revisiting the themes of habit in Blackout? Um, especially given that you're playing the werewolf just as in habit, you're playing the vampire, right? Yeah, so, I mean, the way the tales work is that, um, unlike Glenn, I never think of tales until we have two weeks to perform it. <laughs> and then, uh, it's like this nightmare scenario where I have to come up with something. And um, so I did have a couple of set pieces in mind for a werewolf movie that I've been talking about with Glenn and whoever will listen for some time. And uh, it was time to write a tale. So I threw in a couple of uh, the scenes that might eventually make their way into a feature script. Um, but as usual with my monsters, it's always sort of an existential struggle do you go on if you're a werewolf if you're causing so much uh, pain in the world and you only read about it the next day also i feel like a lot of my stories have sort of alcoholic themes the whole idea of not remembering what you've done mm -hmm. you know are you responsible and and so those are the themes that find their way into this piece i don't know that it's the uh, my favorite tale in terms of its 
even my performance, I don't know that I got anything particularly uh, transcendent, you know, which is what you're always looking for in, in the half hour, you want something that really sticks. And I think when I've acted for Glenn in some of the pieces, I've been quite pleased that they feel like they really are mm. worth re-listening to. Anyway, so Blackout is what it is. I appreciate you bringing it up. I know you're a werewolf aficionado, so that means something to me. Uh, but uh, I love uh, the classic monsters, and it was fun to uh, put my stamp on it. And I'm going to keep pushing uh, and, and tell that story better with the same themes in mind. Well, I think one thing, aside from the fact that it's a werewolf story, one thing I love about it is that it does feel like a thematic sequel to Habit in a lot of ways. Um, so, I, you know, uh, I know that you're working on a, a feature film script from that, and I, I very much look forward to seeing it. Good, I appreciate it. Well, that's one ticket I can claim to the investors is surely sold. <laughs> but, uh, I, I think, you know, as usual, it's sort of the, uh, the lone outsider confronting his shortcomings, uh, probably with a broken heart story in there. I mean, these are my, my themes. They're old existential themes of God's lonely man. And uh, I think there's a cliche out there that you always make the same movie over and over. Now there are some people who actually make completely different movies and that's, those, those are remarkable careers, but I'm gonna fall into the first camp. <laughs> Keep repeating myself until someone listens. <laughs> Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, talk to Glenn about uh, a few of his episodes, and then I'll ask a few questions to wrap up because we're getting close to the hour. Um, but talking of werewolf content, um, Glenn, you've often used tales to tell queer stories, and often in a quite interesting way, in the Ripple of Cedar Lake, or in a, or even in an incidental way, like in uh, Die Sleeping, My Sweet. Um, and I've always found the werewolf story at the center of tales we tell to be particularly clever and effective in that way. Um, so I was wondering, do you think that Tales from Beyond the Pale gives you an outlet to tell queer stories or even just to provide queer representation in a way that the film industry can't or won't? Well, I think the film, the indie film industry has come an awful long way in terms of if I, you know, I feel like, you know, a lot of this stuff could happen, you know, and in, in certainly in indie filmmaking. Um, but yeah, I think as, again with my journey from Tales, it initially started off with uh, just a sure kind of pleasure of being able to tap into these lurid worlds, and then um, I think the the third tale I wrote was the Ripple at Cedar Lake, um, and I don't know that might have been the first time I, I wrote uh, gay characters or uh, queer characters. Um, and that was thrilling because um, I think I tried it before, um, probably in, in, in feature scripts, feature ideas and treatments and so on. But it just sort of, I just find tales very easy to write for. I, I think it's just, it's a handy page count. <laughs> you know, 30 pages, I can write 30 pages, you know, pretty quickly and, and then finesse, you know. Um, so uh, with um, with the ripple at Cedar Lake, I, I just had a lot of fun, um, kind of mucking around with um, a love triangle and just having um, having a bisexual angle in there. Um, and uh, then um, with tales we tell, uh, yeah, it was it just seemed like a, a kind of a no brainer. Do you, you know that sort of riff for that kind of joke that you know the the, the parents in the car are are, are, are it's, it's hinted that they're just completely homophobic mm -hmm. bigots and and morons and and um that they're dealing with a gay kid and and he just turns out to be a werewolf and i i liked uh again these ideas they just came to me pretty easy with tales and and they were easy to get out there you know so um i guess i'm i'm in a way uh, i i'm less precious in what i feel like i i uh should be putting out or so the flow is a lot kind of much more for my soul in a way than than uh, with the film work i've done where i feel like you know so much time and energy gets into getting these things made and and sometimes not even getting these things made that um, 
I think something pure comes out of the art form and the audio drama just by virtue of them being able to come out. And Larry and I at times have been able to really rock these things out quickly because we've had to, you know, I think um, when I was a kid, I was a bass player in a band and we would book gigs before we even knew how to play, you know, it was like, okay, we have six weeks to learn a few songs, you know, and in a way kind of Tales reminds me of that as well, where it's like, okay, we got a gig coming up, coming up in two months, let's get writing, you know. Um, I found myself writing two or three tales and actually having to pick one, you know, so it's, it's been great for my confidence as a writer um, and as a, a gay man to be able to just fuck it, write what I want or write what I'm feeling at the time and, 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 and uh, yeah, loving that. One, one thing that's fun uh, to recollect is the, the same show where we did uh, Clay's piece, the, um, the bed bug movie. Uh, <laughs> we had two other tales. So we did three tales that night. It was really, I don't know what we were thinking. But Glenn had a really uh, somber, political-minded uh, piece about a war criminal and his little nephew. And then uh, I had a piece about these queer dudes who were hosting a party in Hollywood and they were actually vampires and all of this. And the fun thing is a lot of the audience members thought uh, the queer story was Glenn's and this somber political uh, <laughs> job with mine which just shows what people think of us but uh there you have it so we can all wear different hats in the tales universe uh, a few final questions then uh first of all if it's not like asking you to choose between children um do you all have particular favorites i know april's already mentioned like father like son for example i, I take it that is, that is like asking you to choose between children <laughs> <laughs> I'm always a Trawler fan. I, I will go on record and say Trawler. Yeah, Trawler has long been my 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 very favorite. If if I had to pick one that that it's my absolute favorite, it'd be. Is Trawler. the uh, is the fish egg in uh, food chain? Is that a reference to Trawler? It is, in uh -huh. fact. Yeah. Thank you for for bringing that up. Nobody ever catches that, but yeah, it's it's absolutely they're they're in the same world, and I I'm really grateful to Glenn that he let me uh, let me do that. <laughs> it's interesting when Ten I was. Times. When I was writing Trawler, I feel like I was coming out of a, a writer's block. And then when I was directing Trawler, I mean, there was an incident on the way to the studio where I just banged my back up completely. Um, and I had to direct it from the floor. <laughs> it was really embarrassing. <laughs> I was lying on the floor of the studio. I couldn't even see. Well, I could hear what the actors were doing. But uh, so it took me a while to separate, you know, <laughs> the traumatic experience of putting it together to the final product but I'm, I'm it's very nice that you guys like that thank you <laughs> it's so much fun so much yeah, fun um i also love chambers tape i think that's a just mm -hmm. remarkably effective creepy 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 story that kind of sneaks up on you you know because you get about halfway through it before it really starts getting upsetting and by then you're you know you're too far in to get out and it's um and then caper actually was was a bit of an influence on food chain because mm -hmm. i just i love the uh kind of stacking the, the the crime story on top of the horror and sort of you know going back and forth and, and looking at how the genres intersect and how they kind of conflict and, and, and you know bounce off of each other mm -hmm. and um yeah. i think it's just a really fun really clever tale i, I just love all the, the, the intersectional kind of moments you know between genres i think the thing with the chambers tape is that it is legitimately quite relaxing and then all of, a sudden, all of a sudden it gets deeply deeply messed up <laughs> yeah yeah it's a it's a great experience and it's one that you can't interrupt you know it, it's mm -hmm. like if there's any one tale that you must listen to without any interruption it's it's definitely that one it's a headphones episode absolutely so, yeah yeah it's, it's subtle I, as well like it does it does it, i mean it, it obviously pulls the rug from under the uh listener but graham has a light touch you know mm -hmm. so even as things are getting fucked up it's it's, it's, it's slow it's, yeah yeah mm -hmm. somewhat serene as shit's hitting the fan yeah um, i love season three uh, because uh season three was a return to the studio which meant multiple takes <laughs> and you know uh and ha having writing off the back of you know the experience of of um season two uh, the live experience so um 
of season three, we, we kind of have a wraparound story in season three where Larry's host is a lighthouse keeper. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's something that we wrote ourselves in the studio. I don't, I don't think when we even started the season, we realized that that would be the wraparound. Um, but literally we would be scribbling um, uh, that storyline and kind of making it up as we go along. Um, so that's, I'm very, very fond of that piece. Uh, I think also natural selection from season three is a pretty uh, cool piece because it's found footage mm -hmm. or found audio, you know, in a way. And I think that's so cool, you know, that um, I don't know if there are too many found, uh, found footage audio pieces out there, you know? Um, and it was cool that, uh, it was, it's just a really smart piece of casting from Larry to get um, Dominic um, Monaghan and Billy Boyd back together um, on that piece. And um, again, not seeing the creature, not seeing what's going on. Um, it's, it's a piece that really requires the listener to, uh, pay attention and, and the more time that they give it, the, the more that they will we'll get out of it because it gets genuinely creepy on that island at night. Mm -hmm. uh, the air is also a really, I think, a really creepy, really effective ghost story that gets, gets pretty disturbing, you know, that's, um, that's a, a dead air. Movie. Dead air, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it is a favorite of mine because it's, well, it, like Glenn was saying about natural selection, there's something about dead air that is also uh, just very singular. The, the agenda is that it's one guy talking into a microphone mm -hmm. in a radio station. So it, it has a singularity and then all the ghostly things that happen. And like so many tales, it, it evokes some serious stuff. It's a school shooting, you know, without feeling exploitive, it, but it's really evocative and, and and quite despairing in a weird way. Mm -hmm. um, it was that that air was the first tale I heard, so it was the one that hooked oh, me. Oh wow! And it still remains the one that scares me the most. I think. Yeah, I would agree that it's it's the the most upsetting of mm -hmm. any of them. I think yeah. it, just, it just works. You know, it's very effective. Yeah. Um, I'll never okay. forget um, that going over live. It was just fantastic, mm -hmm. and we end with one of our um, one of our troop, uh, Matt Huffman, uh, Matthew Huffman. Uh, just whispering into the mic and you could hear a pin drop in the audience after it was just really chilling wow. and that was a piece i thought really just came to life on the night like i'd read it a few times and thought it was pretty good you know but hearing it on the night it just was really really wiry and nasty it was great and it's a you know, we're talking about graham as a as a writer and a creator uh, but he was also an amazing wingman. He did a lot of the sound design. And of course, one of his great skills, which he brought to Ty West's early film, was just creating dread in an everyday situation. And so there are these tones that are slowly building underneath dead air uh, that are just creating a sense of, of dread. And, and so on many of the shows, we had Graham there. I don't think we've attributed Clay's fine Foley work from uh, some of the live shows as well. In other words, everybody got into the uh, the pit, as it were, uh, to participate in different ways, and it's that's part of the, the fun of, of tales. Okay, uh, I think we'll we'll need to wrap up, but I've got just one last question for you, which is, what's next for Tales from Beyond the Pale? And as an addendum to that, is there anybody you particularly like to work with, either writers or uh, voice talent? Um, I'd love to hear an Anna Asensio episode, personally. Yeah. Uh, well, Glenn, while you formulate a, a proper answer, I will say that we're very proud, and everybody on this Zoom is involved in our next offering, which is a book of scripts uh, from the archives uh, with some commentary by uh, the folks here and... Uh, and also uh, Kim Newman, who of course has written a tale, but he's also from across the pond and a beloved commentator of horror. Uh, and a few other guests will comment and then Glenn and I are presenting uh, 
uh, nine tails. So that is an exclusive, never been announced anywhere. So you guys at Fear 2000 have the scoop. Well, thank you very much. Over. And I, I look forward to it a lot. Glenn, do we have any collaborators we're looking forward to working with? I can't remember. We did have a season started, but we've we've, we've reached out to uh, a few more people, um, and then the pandemic hit. I'm sure we've chatted with Anna about it also, and yeah, it's a fantastic idea. She's such a unique voice in horror. And she's very specific about what she wants to do with horror as well. Like she's taking her time with it. Um, so we'd love to get Anna involved. And then as Tales moves on, um, you know, I think we've now got ourselves a really decent platform. Um, I would like to mix it up a little bit as we move forward. Uh, for instance, I'm working on a, um, a, an audio drama series um, that I could see under the Tales umbrella. It's a 16 episode uh, kind of monster horror, deeply psychological, deeply messed up, deeply personal, uh, that I could see happening within Tales, as well as uh, continuing, continuing to do what, we, what we've already done, which is release uh, live and studio uh, um, individual pieces too. So um, yeah, it's it's been in, it's been a strange time, you know, in this pandemic, taking a taking a step away from it from a little bit for a little bit, um, and I spend quite a bit of my time in Ireland right now. So Larry and I are, aren't on the same um, stretch of land uh, um, all the time, but uh, you know, we got together recently, and you know, we're we are excited to start cooking again. So. Well, I look forward to it. And uh, all that remains to say then is thank you very much to all of you, to Larry, to Glenn, to Clay and to April. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this was great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having us. Bye, everybody. Bye.